develop and update wine knowledge. You will need to conduct formal and informal research such as reading industry publications and supplier information to access current and relevant information about wines. It is very important to keep this information up to date. This will help in identifying any trends in the wine market which can be applied to your workplace. Identify any trends in customer tastes based on your workplace experience and direct contact with the customer. Be sure to share this information with both your colleagues and customers. With this knowledge, you'll be able to contribute to the design, content and pricing of the wine list at your venue. The following sequence will give you an insight into the type of knowledge you will need to develop. Okay, well, the Bortley was uh, started in 1928 by uh, Vittorio and Giuseppina uh, de Bortoli up in Griffith or at Bilbo just outside of Griffith and being uh, Italian immigrants they sort of went up there with the with the flood of immigrants up to that area as it was opening up and you know it seemed to be well it was a great area for um for growing things you know you had the soil and there's the the, the resource of the water and and being uh, traditional Italians they they grew lots of their own food and they made their own wine and it just basically grew from there and they were one of the pioneering families in the area of which there are you know, quite a number of others but uh, De Bortley has grown sort of exponentially. In the mid 80s they decided to look for somewhere a little bit more premium uh, and that came to the cool climate area of the Yarra Valley which we're standing in right now. The coolness of the region gives an extended ripening period and so that enabled the um, the family to concentrate on making some really premium grog out of varieties like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from this area and we've since branched out to, to make um, quite a number of different varieties here which is all emphasis on super premium. So generally um, if you had rich, richer soils will produce richer wines, leaner soils will produce leaner more delicate fine wines. You generally find that richer soils will give you more vigour in the vine, so your vine will be jumping out of the ground and that's probably not all that ideal. You find some, some of those vines will be putting a lot of energy into growing leaf matter rather than banging all that goodies into the fruit. So it's a real, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tackle trying to get all that together. Uh, generally with picking uh, Hand harvesting of fruit is going to give you the premium fruit when it's delivered to the grape, cause all the, uh, to the winery, because all the berries are intact. You're not expressing any juice; it just doesn't have a, a chance to oxidise or anything in that in that time. So, yeah, generally from the most premium blocks on the parcels of fruit that we get in, uh, hand harvesting is uh, an absolute must. And we'll try and um, harvest starting at uh, at first light when it's cool. So you bring in cool fruit and it's not starting to um, deteriorate from that time. It's actually being preserved a little bit by being at the low temperature. And we'll generally try and stop picking by midday so you're not bringing in hot fruit. But uh, we do do some machine harvesting of some blocks and we do it on premium Chardonnay. And you'll just see the, the harvester will just go through and it's almost like it's just caressing them off. You're coming up with these bins of fruit of beautifully intact berries. And so we have that luxury of being able to expedite the, uh, the whole process, but still manage, managing to maintain complete quality and there's no real downturn in that. So that's, that's a good thing. They probably, what a harvester could do in an hour, 100 pickers could do in a day. So yeah, there's real benefits to be gained from that without any real quality loss. Well, crushing of the grapes is uh, you know, pretty much essential for many varieties just to get that separation of juice from the berries, uh, particularly with some fresh and fruity uh, white wines. Within the skins of the grapes, you've got certain phenolic compounds that can give you a, kind of a, a grippy, tactile sensation on the palate, which isn't all that desirable for those varieties. So it's pretty essential to leave the, the berries reasonably intact. And then when you crush them, separate the juice from the skins in the press reasonably quickly to so you're not getting that pickup 
of those things. You just have all these options. And uh, so there's no hard and fast rules. You just might have a bit of a muck around and, and it all comes out in the wash in the end, hopefully. Unoats is reasonably self-explanatory term, um, generally for white wines, uh, particularly fresh and fruity varieties, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, that sort of thing, maybe some Pinot Gris. Essentially it's crushing the grapes straight to tank and they'll see their entire life in stainless steel without seeing any oak. And then if you put wine to oak, then you're going to be drawing obvious oak character and maybe vanillin or coconut or toasty, buttered toast notes from that. So essentially with the unoaked white wines, you're trying to preserve the freshness of the fruit characters. So and just keep them, I wouldn't say simple, but not as complex. Uh, pretty simply, the fermentation process is the uh, conversion of sugar, where, whether it be grape sugar or maltose from barley or something for making beer or whiskey or something like that, into the byproducts of uh, ethanol or alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's that's pretty much it. Essentially the fermentation process will take your initial grape sugar of, of your juice and it will slowly convert that sugar into alcohol. So sugar will go down, alcohol will go up. The difference between red and white wine is, is all in skin contact. Uh, if you were to pick some red grapes and go and crush them immediately and separate the juice from, from the skins, you'd hardly have any colour at all. Uh, you, the, Colour compounds and phenolics all come from the skins, so it's absolute skin contact and fermentation on skins that uh, gets that red colour and gets the phenolic material and the tannins into the wine. Uh, my name's uh, Tarek Highland, I'm the packaging manager here at Bilbul uh, up in Griffith, New South Wales. Uh, basically what I'm responsible for is all the bottling and packaging operations for wine from uh, its liquid form in bulk tanks into, into bottles or casks uh, for, for shipment and distribution uh, elsewhere to, to, the, to the final market point. Uh, the, we bottle both uh, wines that we produce here locally as well as uh, wine that's produced in the other regional areas such as the Arrow Valley uh, the Hunter Valley and King Valley uh, in, in both New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, the, the bottling process basically begins uh, with, with the raw materials. The raw materials is both comprised of the wine, uh, in the case of Yarra Valley wines that's shipped up in bulk transport uh, to, to, to Bilbo, and the dry goods which consists of all the non-wine related products that go into the wine, that is the label, the cardboard box, the, uh, the, the little hoods that go on, the foils, the wires if necessary, and plastic stoppers, and of course the bottles. As the wine comes to the line, we have to get the dry goods to the line. Uh, the first thing that's needed is a bottle to put the wine into. Uh, the bottle is taken from a distribution warehouse and put on a depalletizer. At the depalletizer, we basically remove the bottles from the pallets, convert them to a single feed of, uh, of bottles on, on a conveyor line. Uh, that then allows us to pass that single row of bottles underneath a rinser, which firstly just basically turns the bottle upside down, gets the water into the bottle, and then allows that water to drain out. That's just to ensure that no dust, dirt, insects have gotten into the bottle during transit. From the rinser, it then moves into the filler. Uh, the filling operation is probably one of the most critical uh, areas of the whole packaging department because that's the area where we can actually change the wine. The process of filling is, is actually a multi-stage process, even though it looks like one machine that does one operation, it actually does many operations in, in the process. First operation is to remove the air that's in the bottle. After it's evacuated, we fill the bottle with an inert gas. The reason why we have to put a gas of some description in the bottle is if we didn't do that, the moment we put wine into a vacuum, it frosts greatly immediately, it means you can't get any level control. So after we've put gas back into the bottle, we basically begin the filling process. Basically open up the valve, uh, the wine just flows into the bottle through, through the whole cycle. At the end of the cycle, there's a couple of levelling operations. That's basically just to ensure that we get a consistent level, bottle to bottle. Once the bottle's been filled, we basically grab this cork and we just compress the closure and push it into the bottle. Because cork uh, is made of closed cells filled with air, when one compresses it, it actually relaxes slowly. So when we've compressed it, we've got a bit of time 
to, to push the cork into the right depth before it uh, starts expanding and becoming tight. Post the closure being applied, we, we then start doing the marketing specific uh, work on the bottle, which is uh, label and hood. Uh, that's what gives a bottle a distinctive look and feel on the market shelf and which is often uh, part of the buying power or selling power of, of, a, of a particular bottle or brand of wine. If we're using spill wine, we use a shrink iron hood, which is a plastic uh, material. The hood just gets placed over the bottle and shrunk on. It can basically shrink it on with a heat gun and the machine is basically a big glorified heat gun that goes over, over the neck of the bottle, heats up the neck of the bottle and then shrinks the foil on. Above the uh, hooding or the foil being placed over the, over the bottle, we then uh, go to the labelling. We use two types of labelling on our lines. We use uh, wet gum and a pressure sensitive. Wet gum is basically uh, is equivalent to the process of you grabbing a label, grabbing a, a glue stick, applying it to the back of the label and sticking on the bottle, except we do automate it and do it by machine. Pressure sensitive is, much, is, is a self-adhesive label, so you basically peel it off the backing paper and just stick it on and it adheres without the requirement for any glue. Uh, wet gum is traditionally cheaper than pressure sensitive, which is the reason why it gets used. It's also a complicated process because we have liquid glue, we have a label in a magazine, we basically have a rubber roller which picks up the glue, gets a prescribed amount of glue onto this rubber roller. This roller is then passed past some, some little pickup uh, pallets which pick up some glue off this rubber roller. They, they move around, get pushed up against the label magazine, peel one label off the magazine, the pallet then moves around and gets picked up by a, a gripper finger, grips the uh, label, then takes that label around and applies it to the bottle. So it's, it's a three-stage process, uh, which means there's, there's quite a few things that can go wrong. We currently still employ hand packing. So we, 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 we group the bottles together, stick a divider over, and then put a carton over the top, seal the carton, and move it onto the palletizer. From the packing process, uh, there's a full finished carton, then goes to the palletizer, which is now we've had a automatic palletizers for both main bottling lines now for about three months, and they're working very successfully for us. Uh, essentially, they layer by layer they form the layer to go on a pallet, lift it up, and drop it onto a pallet. So grab the next layer, drop it onto the pallet, fill the pallet complete, move it onto a wrapper uh, where we apply a top sheet and wrap stretch wrap around the wrapper. That then gives us dust security and stability during transport. From there to pick it up, either put it in the warehouse, from the warehouse onto the truck to our distribution centres and, and pass it on from there. Uh, for, for our premium wines or bottles where we're not quite sure what the end market is, we may from time to time choose to do some bottles unlabeled. That is, we bottle them, we put the closure on, the cork or the screw cap, and then we, then we basically box, we put them in boxes, other wineries bin them, and we put them out in the warehouse to be stored for, uh, for a period of time. That, has, that can have a considerable advantage uh, in that we have some flexibility for export orders. It also means that we can store for longer periods some of our premium wines, such as the Noble Ones, some of the Yarra Valleys, so that the wine that we're actually shipping today isn't the wine we produced from this vintage. It might be from a vintage or two back. Uh, that has a big advantage that we've got a pre-aged wine making into the, into the marketplace so they can really so the end consumer can really appreciate the, the, the better and finer qualities of, of those wines. These unlabeled wines, we generally put the, apply the labels from the hoods on an as demand or on a per order basis. So when an order comes in for one of these wines or we're running or our, or our immediate stocks are, uh, are, are getting low, we, we, we produce another batch. These are all pressure sensitive, that means they're all self-adhesive labels and we run them through a miniature bottling line that basically can put a hood on. Uh, apply a front and rear pressure sensitive label, a metal if, if needed, and then get the carton. Uh, it is a higher cost operation because we have to basically rework wine that we've already bottled. So there's extra, extra storage, there's extra handling, uh, but we, quite, we willingly do that because we end up with a better product, a better quality bottle of wine in terms of label quality coming out at the end of the, end of the product.